I hope you had an enjoyable lunch break. Um, welcome back uh, to our traffic final conference. My name is Martin Wagner. I'm senior policy advisor at uh, the International Center for Migration Policy Development, ICMPD. Uh, and I will uh, guide you through this afternoon, uh, through this uh, panel. Um, and for those who probably came later here or um, uh, watch us online and uh, only now visit us. Uh, this is the final traffic conference. Uh, the traffic project is a Horizon 2020 uh, project, uh, which uh, investigates um, uh, on uh, transnational figurations of displacement of situations where people are uh, in uh, long-term uh, displacement situations. And we looked in this project in the last three years, uh, what kind of solutions can be there. In the morning, uh, we started off and we spoke a bit about our vision. Uh, and uh, this vision uh, was uh, where we said, um, the vision includes more options for displaced people uh, to use mobility, to use networks uh, in order to form solutions for them and to also follow the networks that they have. We had then uh, a panel, uh, on a global panel, uh, where we had uh, colleagues um, from different regions where the traffic research ha has been conducted over the last three years. Uh, we had um, uh, some, some insights into Tanzania, Ethiopia, Jordan, um, uh, Pakistan, uh, and Tanzania. Um, and in this panel now in the afternoon, we want to concentrate on the European situation. Uh, traffic also looked uh, in three countries specifically in the situation of Italy, Greece, and Germany, where we also conducted a variety of, um, of uh, research and uh, interviews with displaced people. Now, uh, protracted displacement, we heard about the term in the morning. Uh, we often or more are used to speak about uh, protracted displacement in the global dimension. But uh, we also found uh, in the traffic research that protracted displacement and something also exists in Europe in a variety of reasons. Uh, people cannot uh, make use of the potential that they have. Uh, there are a variety of uh, restrictions that they face, which make it simply very difficult for them to uh, also make use of their potential. Uh, to get a glimpse about the research that was done, um, uh, we want to start this panel off with a short introductory video, which our colleagues uh, Fieri uh, in Italy um, uh, made, uh, with a, uh, uh, recorded. And I would invite uh, Ferruccio Pastore, director of Fieri, to say a few words about uh, the video now, uh, and then we will watch together the video. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, just a couple of words to, to explain why this video. Um, social sciences are making increasing use of, of documentary films, of visual methods in general. And this is also what we did. Uh, why? Uh, it's not just because it's uh, trendy. Now, there are specific reasons we think why it makes sense in a project like this to have visual methods and the documentary. Uh, first of all, it's, it's a nice and effective way to communicate our research findings beyond the narrow boundaries of a research community. Uh, but not only, it's also a nice way to relate back and again with our research participants in, in all the countries that were uh, investigated, where we conducted research. And it's a way to, to bring back something, to give a feedback that is not a specialist feedback. You know, it's not the, the Reports back there are something that is necessary and useful and important, but only targeting a certain target. We need more. We need to get back to the research participants who gave us their time, you know, their sensitivity, their you know, experience. And, and this is a way that, that can do this, that allows this in an effective way. And a third function, I think, is that uh, a video like this give us also as researchers, uh, teaches us something that does not emerge from traditional research methods. You see, you grasp something from a, a, a documentary, if it is a good documentary, 
built in close cooperation between filmmakers and researchers that you wouldn't grasp through interviews or through focus groups. It can be just uh, an expression. It can, it can be a, a way of, of reporting things. It can be a, a form of agency of protagonism that doesn't emerge in an interview that sets the interviewed person in a, uh, in a passive position, or at least this is a risk, and can give them the floor, you know? And this is also important. And these two, in particular, these two latter functions of the documentary are especially important when you work with migrants uh, and with forced migrants, or persons in protracted displacement, persons that are usually uh, invisible, made invisible, that are usually often marginalized. And a documentary can be a way, a poor thing, it's not nothing you know, that solves anything, but to give a, a small moment of empowerment, a small moment of visibility, which is appreciated. We have been screening the film in, in a couple of locations so far in Italy with research participants, and it was highly appreciated. I think the same thing will happen in Greece where another uh, documentary was shot. Uh, so the documentary that we'll, you will see is one of uh, a few, <clears throat> Uh, formats we produced. So the, the large version of the Italian documentary is, is longer. It couldn't be shown here, unfortunately. Uh, the uh, director is uh, Andrea Fantino, who couldn't be here, but I thank, but I thank uh, warmly. Um, there are then, uh, this is a shorter version, a sort of trailer that you will see, seven or eight minutes. And then we have a Greek uh, documentary that maybe later on uh, Panos can, can just uh, say a word on. Um, uh, one final thing, it's, it's shot in three different localities in Italy, very different localities, all of which, however, host persons in, in a condition that we defined protracted displacement along the, the conceptual lines that were illustrated this morning. Uh, the first locality is in Northern Italy, Northwest, place called Saluzzo, that is a large uh, rural agricultural district uh, near in Piedmont, near Torino, uh, that is every season home to several uh, workers, seven, several seasonal workers, many of which are de facto in a condition of protracted displacement with different statuses, but still uh, with some commonalities that we uh, tell more about later. Second uh, locality is, is in Rome, where there is a very large migrant population, a, a sizable section of which can be defined as in a condition of protracted displacement. And the documentary was uh, shot uh, in occupied uh, houses, occupied uh, places, squats, where many of these uh, people are forced to, to live because of lack of other housing solutions. Third locality is Castel Volturno in Campania, the region of Naples, north of Naples, uh, also a, a region uh, with, with agricultural, uh, cattle industry, and a large uh, presence of uh, uh, largely undocumented or very poorly documented, let's say, uh, migrants, mainly from West Africa. So this is what we will see. Uh, and to conclude, I just mentioning before, uh, colleagues of mine, researchers who were conducting the research in the field in close cooperation with the filmmaker. And these are Pietro Cingolani, who worked in Saluzzo, uh, Emanuela Roman, who supervised the fieldwork process, um, Milena Belloni, who carried out the, the research in, in Rome, and Giuseppe Grimaldi, who was leading the fieldwork in, in Campania. Yeah. Thank you. Let's watch it together and then we continue.
Io direi la fortuna e la volontà sono sempre due cose che vanno insieme. Nel senso che a volte ci serve la fortuna per avere quello che vuoi. Ma non serve sol, sol, soltanto avere la fortuna, ma serve anche avere la volontà di fare qualcosa. Perché in francese si dice è di tua e il ciel ti dirà. Vuol dire che aiutaci e il cielo ti aiuterà. Quindi non puoi stare lì a dormire, devi cercare, devi piegare le maniche della camicia, andare e con la fortuna troverà qualcosa. Sto pensando come io posso trovare un lavoro che afficcia, che contiene sempre, senza fermo, e sto pensando a queste cose qui, e sto pensando come io posso trovare un... come in fa io fa per trovare una soluzione per andare in Africa per trovare il saluto mia mamma e le felicità, sono trovato i documenti nell'Italia e vado di saluto, poi se fa tanti anni fa non lo vedo, che fa cinque anni non lo vedo adesso. Adesso ho mia famiglia qui e comunque e io sono uscita, l'ha portato tutto quanto qua perché non riesco a tornare a casa perché ho asilo politica. Perciò forse vengono loro, almeno mi sento un pochina, almeno adesso so, almeno ho famiglia. Invece prima sempre manca qualcosa. Comunque... Siamo qua. Bello Roma. <ride> It has been amazing, it has been okay, but my life generally I want more than I am now. I want to, I'm a mother that I want to be more useful in the society. I'm a mother that I want to donate more in the society on my own way. My dream now is especially, I can't resist music when i see music i must dance i love good rhythm of music dance so i like to above all i want to do something more tangible in life not just being a mother but being someone maybe in, in the film part in cinema or in teatro because that is where i found myself happy Io il territorio di Castelvotullo, eh, come l'ho detto in un'intervista, che se non ci fossero i migrati forse sarà sparito nella... Perché mh, io dirò, la maggior parte ehm, di questo territorio, diciamo, un percentuale è vissuta dalla comunità migrante. E è un territorio in cui... Mh, eh, Oggi ormai sappiamo che tutti, la maggior parte dei migranti che ci vivono lì sono senza documenti, diciamo, quindi sono delle persone che lo Stato credo che sono delle persone senza regole, senza, sono stato, è come una delle persone che sono state dimenticate, sono rimaste nel dimenticatoio, ma nello stesso tempo è un territorio in cui noi diamo molto, perché da lì, si trova molte persone che lavorano la terra, um, che lavorano nei, nei, nei campi, nei um, raccolti del pomodoro, uh, lavorano con, um, um, 
fanno dei lavori che forse uh, gli italiani non vogliono fare. Per me ora andare, andare via è già per me un perdita, un perdita di tempo dopo, dopo tutto quello che ho fatto, tutti questi anni che ho fatto qui, tutte le persone che con, ho conosciuto qui. Io so già, già cosa, cosa fare, non vedo più perché mi, mi devo avventurare in un posto che io non conosco dove io devo riniziare tutto da capo. Mi sono pure iscritto a un, a un corso all'Università Scienza Politica, no? quindi, che dura tre anni, quindi io non posso buttare via tutto questo percorso. E, mh, allora ho capito che il mio posto proprio è qui. <laughs> Thank you for this video. Probably we'll turn again the light on. And I would now invite uh, Panos, Benjamin, and Ferruccio to us here on the stage. Yeah, please uh, take a seat here, on the right here. Okay, something that I was always afraid of that would happen happened exactly now. So I would like to start with you. Uh, yeah, Ferruccio, uh, I would like to directly continue with you after this uh, short clips. clip. Um, um, I think the documentary or this, this part uh, shows a lot about in what uncertainty people are um, and uh, that they are afraid to waste their time and uh, indeed, as the title says, um, ask themselves, where is my place or is this my place? Uh, now, can you please tell us a bit more from your research uh, that you did, um, and uh, particularly also what kind of coping, strat coping strategy people use uh, uh, to, to navigate through this um, yeah, despair in, in many, many ways. Um, and of course, also one of our themes uh, very dominantly now in, in the traffic project is mobility, so probably also how mobility plays here uh, an, an important role. Please. Okay, thank you. Thanks again, Martin. Yes, the music is by Califu Ground, that is a group mainly by refugees and migrants uh, based in Castel Volturno. Califu is uh, Libyan Arabic, uh, and it's the little squares where immigrants in Libya uh, find themselves early in the morning to get recruited for the day by, 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 by employers, casual employers, let's say. And the same thing you find in Castel Volturno and in many other places, not only in Italy, but in Europe. This is why they, they called it Califu Ground. Not you, everybody. <laughs> uh, okay, mobility, yes, definitely. Um, this morning we talked 
insistently in depth about immobility, forced immobility, uh, immobilization, uh, containment of refugees. Uh, and, and this is, and then we talked about mobility as a solution, free mobility, legal mobility as a, as a way out of protracted displacement. Um, however, elusive a solution. Uh, a livelihood, livelihood strategy, so internal mobility in the Congo, for instance, as, as it was described very well by, by Patrick. But the picture is more complex than this. Uh, the equation is not as simple as this. It's not just immobility problem, mobility solution. The, the, the equation is more complicated. Uh, uh, there are gray areas gray forms of mobility. Uh, mobility is not always the contrary of immobility, the antony of immobility. You can have, uh, you can be mobile even in a labyrinth. You know, the metaphor that was used this morning, you, you can be mobile even in a labyrinth. You know, the metaphor that was used by, by Elvan this morning. Uh, you know, moving around in the labyrinth and still it's mobility. Um, mobility can be a, a survival uh, strategy, uh, but it can be the only survival strategy in certain situations. And then it can become a doom, a trap. Mm -hmm. um, in this sense, uh, you know, this is shown by all of our research in different forms, but in many different contexts, you see this double nature of mobility emerging. Uh, and in particular, in the, in the work we, we did in Europe, in Western Europe, Southern Europe, uh, Italy, Greece, and Germany, with, with an appendix uh, done in, in the Netherlands, uh, you see this. And, and you see that this kind of mobility is multi-layered. Uh, you have this, this form of survival constrained mobility happens at local level. Uh, at internal level within country borders, you know, from Greek islands to the mainland and back in some cases, <clears throat> from Southern Italy, from Castel Volturno to Northern Italy, maybe following the crops, you know, you, you follow the season, you collect, you pick up, you know, uh, tomato first, then citrus, then you move north to pick up the apples, and, and the kiwi maybe, and then you, you go for harvesting the grapes and that's your life. It's a circuit of survival across uh, harvest uh, territories and periods. Um, but this can happen also at the international, at the transnational intra EU informal mobility. You may have a status in Italy maybe a very weak, temporary, fragile humanitarian status, but still a status that allows you to move, you know, under certain conditions within the Schengen space. Uh, and then you go harvesting maybe in Spain, um, informally, you know, you cannot take a legal job, but you go. Or even we have witnesses of, uh, persons going from Italy to, to do some construction work in Malta for some time and then back. And so this sort of intra u short-term mobility, staying within the allowed three months or exceeding the three months, overstaying, um, undergoing, uh, and then returning to the main country of administrative attachment where you have you know, a sort of status, sort of status because it's usually very weak and with no guarantee to, to anything basically, uh, but still you have it. And then you go back to renew it from maybe you, you work informally, let's say in, in Germany and then you can and your state permit from, from Italy, but it can be the other way around. I mean, it's less frequent maybe, but it, it can happen. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, very messy space of transnational mobility that Europe has become with financial 
you go back to renew your permit or you go back to, to, to have a vaccine shot or you go back to, you know, to get health treatment when needed, where you are somehow entitled to. Uh, so this kind of intra you mobility, survival mobility, uh, that is semi-formal, informal, is, is largely illegalized in, in the European Union, as you know, I mean, you cannot do it, you're not supposed to do it. Uh, uh, mainly, uh, it's illegalized based on very politicized narratives about what secondary mobility is, you know, uh, that is often constructed as a security risk, which is, in our experience, it didn't emerge as such. On the contrary, it's a survival strategy, uh, you know, uh, fitting into specific niche of the labor markets. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, for many migrants, it's the only survival strategy. So to conclude, uh, what does this imply in practical terms, in policy terms? We think that, uh, I think it's a collective, you know, stance of a, of a group, to a, a research group that, that uh, Regulatory strategies based on denial, on removal, on neglect, uh, or on criminalization, or in any case, legalization, do not work. I mean, it's not an ideological stance, but it's an evidence based uh, statement that we make here. Uh, because the pool of these mm, protractedly displaced Europeans, as they are now, <laughs> Europeans by residence for some years many of them for, for dozens of years, uh, the pool is expanding constantly. Uh, so uh, we should, I guess, uh, we guess, uh, acknowledge this reality, uh, recognize it, uh, and then think creatively and pragmatically of gradual strategies of, gradual and selective strategies of re-legalization of these forms forced constrained mobility. So why not, for instance, extending the period of three months that you're, you're allowed to move? Why not, why not making it four or five or six? Why not allowing people who find a job during these four, five or six months to take a job uh, and, and so on? So we know this is taboo, but we think that the only way to break taboos is based on evidence. And this is what we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ferruccio. Um, this uh, gave us already quite an, a, a glimpse into uh, um, the research situation in, in, in Europe and uh, particularly where you point uh, at the fact that people follow opportunities, um, whether they are now legal or not legal or semi-legal, as you pointed it out. Um, I would like now to, to uh, come to you, Panos. Um, um, Panos had you blue and still don't know the, the pronunciation. I'm so sorry for that. This is a professor at the uh, um, School of uh, Spatial Planning and uh, Development uh, and a uh, traffic partner also. Um, Anos, you did uh, coordinate the research in Crete. Um, is this uh, what Ferruccio uh, said before, common finding, or is the situation a bit more nuanced in, in, in Greece also with regards to um, different types of uh, restrictions within Greece, also where, where mobility is in other ways? Please, Panos, what are your, are your thoughts? Thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon to my part. Uh, some of the colleagues in the team who brought it closer to it. Okay, now better, yeah? Uh, are also with us, uh, Eva and Alexander, as Greg has mentioned. Uh, yeah, there are, there are many similarities, and that's what we found working along with the research and often finding it and uh, making sense of them uh, and comparing the two countries like in the report that you shared. There are also quite, uh, quite a few differences. Um, so um, one thing that uh, is, is useful in the Greek case, uh, at least one thing that is useful not to forget, is that Greek policies are designed as part of, as well as Italian, at least as part of the um, European border regime, especially after 2015 in the case of Greece. Its reception system was built in the spirit of the hotspot approach and the framework of, of the EU-Turkey uh, statement of March 2016. In this context, there was a political choice to shelter newcomers in, uh, in camps or camp-like facilities, 
um, <clears throat> while a geographical restriction was imposed to those arriving on the islands who are forced to stay there until their case is examined, with a few exceptions. Uh, so this, among other things, created uh, different layers, geographical layers this, uh, this time, and geographical hierarchies within the reception system, uh, filtering displaced people's mobilities, apart from rendering, temporarily, rendering them temporarily immobile and containing them in the islands or in the mainland camps. The islands are a first stepping stone, the mainland camp is the next one, moving to Athens, probably a, th a third one, and then possibly for some also uh, elsewhere in, uh, in, the, in, in some other European countries uh, in ways uh, similar to some extent to those described by Ferrucci. <clears throat> uh, soon after we started field work, just to give, to give you an impression, the population of asylum seekers in the islands were, were exceeding uh, 42,000, much, much less uh, now mostly residing in five so-called hotspots. You may have heard of Moria on Lesbos, where the mobilization of about uh, 20,000 residents at the time also led to escalated tensions with local communities uh, as a side effect. It's important to, to remind also that back in 2015, Greece uh, lacked a significant infrastructure uh, and for the reception of asylum seekers, legal, institutional, administrative. The events at the time were, of the time were catalysts. They built indeed an asylum system from reception to protection, but in doing so, it can create a labyrinth. It, uh, as, uh, pointing to the complex set of policies, procedures uh, that the displaced are, are being faced with. Well, what is more, uh, there have been constant amendments, new legislations, um, shifting policies, uh, changing procedures, and so on, again mentioned in the morning panel. Uh, more, more generally and globally. And all these twists created further waiting and limbo, adding to the uncertainty and blocking of uh, displaced people's um, mobility. And what we've learned is how this, through, through our work, is how this plays on life. We also uh, come across instances of how uh, people uh, cope, uh, the different strategies they develop, the different practices they perform in order to of regain some, some control over, some degree of control over their lives uh, to, to move, in order to be able to move both in geographical space, but to move on uh, into their, their, uh, their lives. Um, so various strategies have been uh, observed and recorded, but as far as mobility is concerned, very, very similar um, um, examples to, to uh, some, some of which were described in the case of Italy or even in other cases. When it comes to being mobile, for instance, when in, within the country, uh, we came across practices of make, making strategic use of the system, uh, or, um, rendering, producing them, them, uh, some people producing themselves as vulnerable subjects in order to uh, be able to, um, to, to move on, or going through its cracks and gaps, or sometimes also entirely bypassing it, making, the, making their way and navigating through the different layers being um, earlier mentioned. Leave the islands, move between the camps, from camp to camp, or uh, from the camp to the city, uh, or, or even um, um, uh, leave the country. Not so much in order to, to find a job in our experience, and that's another difference with the, with the Italian case, at least as a re resulting from, from the research, for asylum seekers at least, who also were, were a big part of our uh, participants. Uh, of course, this was also the case, but mostly we came across uh, such strategies while people trying to addressing their needs and at the same time uh, reuniting with, uh, with their networks, reuniting with mostly with family members, usually of the extended family. Uh, even if this may be regular and danger, they are asylum case, uh, put them at, uh, at risk. The very same motives and similar strategies may be observed in, in the so-called solidarity movements. Uh, so um, people uh, are, are relying on networks, not just people rely on their networks in order to move, but they are also moving, what we see, uh, in order to, to be close, to, to follow their um, networks. Needless, again, perhaps, and I close by this to, to remind here um, also that uh, Greece is, a, is a, like Italy, perhaps, is a first entry country. Uh, it is rich by 
resources are reached by people who have long-term difficult and perilous journey uh, that they came through, but uh, uh, they reach a country without a Schengen border at the southeast corner, corner, southeast corner of the EU, which is for many of them a country of passage, a, a country of transit. Uh, for, uh, so I think we need to keep this in, uh, in uh, mind when uh, addressing those people crossing it or, or seeking for uh, safety and better life chances. Thanks, Panos. Um, um, yeah, I think a, a bit a, a different uh, uh, picture from, from Italy uh, we have here. Um, mobility within the country restricted for other reasons, but uh, uh, also um, overcome by other purposes, partly less the labor part of it. Um, but um, uh, also thankful for pointing out uh, about the networks, uh, our second um, uh, quite prominent feature in, in traffic. and. Uh, Brings me quite quite nicely to to, to Benjamin. Uh, uh, you mentioned before that um, uh, people follow their networks also, and uh, we also looked in, in traffic how uh, people follow the networks. And I would like to come to you now, Benjamin. Benjamin Edsold, who was not with us in the morning, um, uh, co um, a scientific coordinator of the traffic project. Um, Benjamin, uh, when we look into networks, um, we look uh, into uh, transnational, uh, uh, national, local networks. Um, how did, uh, in your research, uh, did you see the transnational networks um, um, yeah, decided also the trajectories that, uh, that uh, people take on their flight uh, uh, moving on? Uh, and, uh, and of course, also in what way is the potential of networks as a coping strategy? Uh, well, you can sit from, from the research that you did in, in Germany reflecting this. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I want to send my greetings to you by the research team uh, who did to, together did a research in Germany, led by Simone Christ, um, our colleague at um, Ethics. Um, just quickly, want to come 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 back to an instant from the movie. Um, so you heard from Dia from Senegal um, that he was hoping to get legal papers. I mean, on the one hand, he's trying to secure his own situation there. He's simply trying to fly home to see his mother, no? And then returning probably to, to Italy to secure his future in Italy. It's a simple need to live the transnational life in a sense to being able to connect with one's family. There was also the instance of Abaya from, um, from Eritrea or so, who was seemingly separated from her family uh, and now parts of her family are there they are now together in Greece, and now she feels less alone now. Um, so she overcome family separation. She overcome maybe the force of having to live a transnational life, and now can live, I think, more peacefully together with her family. Just, just bear, bear that in mind. Um, when we talk about transnational networks and how they shape journeys, how they sh shape the opportunities um, for people who have been displaced, I think first we have to think about, okay, what type of networks people, people are embedded in, could be very different one. Could be family, family relations, family networks, um, other people um, are having had business partners. Um, and, and in that sense, we came across many stories in, um, in our research in Germany, where people have had ties to Germany before. They have been, have been forced to flee. We have had businessmen who had been traveling in the Gulf, who had been working in Germany, who had been trading goods from between Germany and Syria, and never imagined that they once would be displaced. But when they were forced, uh, forcibly displaced, of course, because they had worked in Germany before, it was a natural place for them um, to go to. And it's like the same what we see now with displacement from, from Ukraine. Certainly sort of the, the, the type of networks matter in which you are embedded. And it's the quality of relations. We heard that already, already in, the, in, the, in the morning or in the global panel, panel as well. So of that you have a network connection to a relative, to a, to, um, an outdoor cousin or a brother um, living in Germany and you are yourself in Jordan, maybe it doesn't necessarily mean that you can follow, follow that person. Um, you know, there's particular rules about um, family unification, for instance, that only dependent um, people, so either your, your parents, or so if you're a minor, um, or your own children, uh, also can, can, can follow you, but um, you cannot bring your brother or your sister, for instance, or your cousin. And then I think sort of always there's a different 
specific position you take in within a network, also within your family. Um, it's different expectations that um, uh, that you also have or that the family has to you if you maybe as the eldest son in a, in a family, if you take an irregular journey um, to Europe um, and then you're expected to send money back to support the family being back. Uh, there might be other expectations um, yeah, to, to a daughter or if you're a grandparent. Um, so we have seen many different ways how um, people facilitated their journeys to Germany through their networks. How? You know, for providing information, sharing knowledge, sharing experiences of one's own journey, of course, through social media, that's easy to always transfer that information. Um, and one sort of somebody has established a journey and can tell others how to do it. Of course, this helps, helps others. It's about providing links to places, links to people um, on the move and after arrival. Um, it's about, of course, facilitating regular journeys, what I was already mentioned in terms of like family reunification. There have also been humanitarian admission schemes um, in Germany, which were very important um, for the Syrian community, where people could name others, um, relatives, and not only family, close um, family members, um, dependent family members with family unification. Um, and this were complemented through private and, and, and community sponsorship, a very important tool in my opinion, but also like study opportunities or so that have been offered. And in some cases sort of that we heard sort of we have seen like a chain of migration that was initiated maybe more than 20 years ago through one person seeking asylum in, 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 in Germany, um, a Syrian Kurd um, who then had family reunification uh, with his wife. And um, 20 years later, um, a cousin or a niece came as a student that was supported by the family. And then that student, that young lady, she initiated um, the um, humanitarian admission through community sponsorship, through which then the other, her parents and her siblings could come. So you have different modes that are interconnected and the different pathways are interconnected. But we also see, of course, and there was ample ev evidence for that sort of that um, people who have been living now in, in Germany for long or so, they're also contributing to supporting irregular journeys uh, to Germany. So when we ask people how they were financing the smugglers, paying for the smugglers, that money came either from people in the home country, from people who are already at a destination, or from people abroad in US or, or, or in Canada, for instance. We've also seen that, you know, people have to pay ransom, you know, if, if they're um, uh, put in prison in, in Libya. Um, and you are freed from prison if you are, you know, that's through your transnational contacts only. Sort of um, your, your, your uncle in the US pays that money or people, people you know in Ethiopia pay that money. And only through this transnational connections, you can leave the prison in Libya and hopefully take a boat and arrive safely. If you do not pay that ransom to release you, just, you remain stuck, you're imprisoned. And we all know how incredible dire these conditions are. Important for me is to stress once more sort of that there are multiple barriers to these formal pathways. Um, and this creates protracted displacement elsewhere in the world, right? This creates situations where people are living in precarious conditions, where they, are, where they face labor exploitation, for instance, in, in Turkey, and it leads to incredible suffering, right? It leads to uncertainty, it leads to re traumatization. We've had cases where people, you know, have been separated from their family members for six years, for, for eight years. A mother from Eritrea who fled to Germany six years ago had minor children who she left with her own mother in Ethiopia. And still six years later, even though she as a refugee, recognized refugee in Germany, she's formally entitled for family reunification. It has not been possible yet to reunite with her own children. Um, and I think this, these, these are, I mean, due to bureaucratic hurdles that are there, due to like legal documents people have. I mean, that's also well known for the case of the case of Eritrea, and yeah, and these barriers and these hurdles um, um, must be overcome. I think already spoke a lot though, but uh, the potentials of networks they should have become clear. I think you made it clear about the, uh, the potential of networks, uh, but also um, the, the, the other side of it that uh, it's not always just. Um, um, the only possibility or the only solution uh, that it provides, it also has some, some repercussions in one way or the other. I think. 
Can I just have, I forgot one, what is important to me. I think we should not only think about these networks in a functional sense, right? But they're like the social relations, it's people relations, there are value in themselves. And we have, for instance, also a right to a family, family life. And this right to family life should always, always be superior to, let's say, the migration control strategies um, of states who are, who are impeding, impeding this right to family life. Thanks. Um, I think we uh, now uh, should open up this uh, male, uh, completely ungender based uh, panel. And I would like to invite uh, uh, <laughs> uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, the European Commission and, um, and uh, uh, Danish Refugee Council to, to join us, please, on the podium here. Thank you. Um, we actually have, uh, it works, okay. We have one more uh, uh, participant from, from UNHCR. And um, in times uh, like this, uh, I forgot to mention that we have an in-person meeting. Uh, I'm very um, uh, sorry to, to UNHCR who um, uh, is waiting and uh, we just made it that, uh, that uh, you can be with us uh, online. Uh, it was a bit of a mistake that I did. Um, and uh, I really apologize. Um, uh, this is Lara Ivanova uh, from UNHCR joined us now. Uh, very glad that you could make it. Uh, my apologies um, that I made this um, uh, lapse here. So I would like to start then actually with you. Um, I hope you were able to follow our discussion probably already partly in the morning also when we speak about protracted displacement. And um, I actually also told this in my introduction that actually we speak mainly about protracted displacement more in non in the EU context too much. Uh, but I think what we heard now from all three, from Panos, from uh, Ferruccio and uh, from Benjamin, there are situations where people are in, 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 yeah, in kind of limbo for a long time uh, um, period. Uh, so I would like to, to ask you from, from UNHCR side, uh, what, uh, how does UNHCR address such situations and um, how does it relate also to your work? Uh, with EU institutions, and probably you can a bit reflect on, on, on this notion and, 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 and your work in particular here. I hope the tone will also work. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I hope that you can hear me well and see me well. Um, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Um, and it's been very interesting to follow this event from the beginning. I wasn't able to follow entirely the morning session, but um, I got bits and pieces. Uh, and I'm sorry I cannot be in person with you, but in any case, um, I'm very happy to participate. Um, a very important topic, uh, one that we have been dealing with on the EU level for a long time. Um, it is one of our uh, challenges, so to say, in the, in the EU um, to see how to put forward uh, a policy which works, which doesn't allow for protracted situations as discussed, uh, which gives refugees and asylum seekers um, adequate reception conditions, dignified reception conditions, um, and does not allow room for um, long situations in limbo. Um, we have been working on this for quite some time. Um, in the, here in our Brussels office, we engage with the EU institutions um, on a daily basis, um, particularly when it comes to the uh, policies on asylum. We have been in close and we remain in close contact with the Commission, um, as well as with the Council and the Parliament. Um, and we always start from the right to seek asylum, which is a right established in the Geneva Convention in EU law, uh, which cannot have any derogations and cannot be applied uh, with any kind of discrimination. Um, so this is our basic uh, starting point. Um, when the reform of the asylum system started a few years ago, um, we came forward with our idea of what an uh, EU asylum system should look like. Um, we developed a, a very detailed proposal, um, which is called Better Protecting Refugees in the EU and, and Globally. Um, and this is still valid to this day, uh, because many of the ideas uh, that we had then, which we think would bring forward a, a better and improved EU asylum policy, um, are still needed. Um, as we all know, not much progress has been made um, since uh, the first proposal that the Commission made in 2016. 
Um, but uh, new and new challenges keep coming up. Um, and the latest one, of course, being Ukraine. Um, our key calls uh, for a better, uh, for an improved EU asylum policy are also contained in our uh, seven key calls document, as we call it. It's a shorthand for the main things that we think should be in the basis of, um, of a improved EU asylum system. And that um, starts with the access to protection for all. Um, of course, fair and fast EU asylum procedure is absolutely necessary as well to avoid protracted situations, more legal options to find um, safety in the EU. And this includes um, family reunification as mentioned uh, earlier by previous speakers, as well as any other um, complementary pathways and uh, resettlement, um, of course. And then uh, integration, um, we would really like to see um, a step up in the integration efforts that member, st member states are doing and we're advocating uh, with them and with institutions on that quite a lot. Um, but we know that uh, on the EU level, legislating on integration um, is not entirely possible. So um, we advocate for uh, whatever it can be done from here so that it's applied uh, later on by member states. Um, when it comes to the new pact, um, which we think that the, the new pact on asylum and migration is a good opportunity um, to uh, make um, the, these key calls possible. Um, we, have, we are happy to see that the pact highlights the added value of refugees and migrants uh, particularly when it comes to their place in the integration. Um, there is the, the action plan on integration and inclusion, which was proposed as part of um, the pact, is also something positive. And um, we, have, we still welcome that um, all actors embrace a multi-stakeholder and whole of society approach as it was put forward by the commission with the um, extensive consultations um, with refugees and asylum seekers. This should be in the, at the core. Um, when it comes to um, a positive step forward, we are happy to see last week, for example, uh, the new proposal from the commission on, the, um, on a reform of the single permit directive and the long-term residence directive. Um, which, think, which we think could be also a step uh, in the right direction um, for refugees, particularly when it comes to their possibility to, to um, acquire long-term residence status, uh, which would um, offer more security and stability. Um, when it comes particularly to integration, um, we, uh, we have been, we are working more on the member states level with uh, directly with uh, member states, but um, we have also included a set of key recommendations um, in our presidency recommendations, as we call them. This is a document that we prepare every year for the um, two consecutive council presidencies, which highlights the key challenges that we're facing currently and um, a key asks that they are put that they are um, dealt with um, in a in a steadfast manner and specifically on integration we encourage we, we continue to encourage member states to ensure that at least 30 percent of the overall budget that they have is earmarked to support integration measures and adopt practical measures and support for muni municipal officials and local actors. Integrations, as we know, happens at the local level um, within communities. And it's important that more of those actors have direct access to AMEF funding. Um, we also, as mentioned, support the swift adoption of the amendment of the long-term residence directive. We hope that member states will take this as a priority uh, coming forward. Um, we also call on member states to provide timely and adequate support 
and reduce practical barriers to socioeconomic inclusion. We know that many, many times there is a policy on the ground or there is the legal framework on the ground, but there are many practical impediments to refugees and asylum seekers to reach out to source to those services. Um, so early integration measures in that regard uh, need to be taken forward um, with an evidence-based approach. This is something that we strongly believed in. There are already quite a few good practices that could be taken uh, forward in various member states. Um, and then lastly, but really key is to ensure that refugees participate in the design and the implementation, as well as the review of integration programs, um, and also promote the positive narrative about their contribution to their communities. Um, I don't know whether there is much more time. I think this is uh, the gist of it. <laughs> but let me know. Yes, let me know. I'm happy to answer some questions. I don't know where I have to show you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you also particularly to that you pointed uh, um, us towards uh, a, a few key documents that are not only with the new pact, but also with the long-term residence permit. Uh, long-term residence directive, also something that we discussed in the European uh, um, um, research that we did in traffic. Uh, but I, th I think one thing that we found is actually there's actually quite little knowledge uh, about this uh, possibility uh, among migrants and uh, refugees and uh, actually also about um, local stakeholders in, in, in many, many ways. But I think we'll come back to this um, one more time. Uh, I would like now to, to uh, turn to, to um, uh, Birte Schorpion. Um, she's a uh, EU uh, policy and advocacy advisor at the Danish Refugee Council. Um, and uh, yeah, I think you also very closely follows, uh, follow the, the, the the day when people should actually be applying for a job, um, going to the job and so on. The second example is at the locations where these centers are so far away where we see most refugees actually being based. Uh, so we see that people are often, these centers are placed in a location where refugees have very limited possibilities. And this is why their network, um, is, their network is somewhere else, it makes it very difficult for them to be in a place um, where they have no network just because this is where the language classes are. And like this, there are a couple of um, obstructions that actually prevent people to integrate. And this is something that we do not only see at the moment that they are recognized as refugees, but that we also see beforehand. Because when people are going through the asylum procedure in Greece that can take multiple years still in some cases, people do not have access to, for instance, language classes. Um, also, often language classes are only available in Greece, while Greek, while actually uh, many people are on 
even often encouraged to leave Greece, uh, which makes it very difficult for them to be um, to be integrated. In addition to that, I think the Greek government, especially over the latest years, has of course in, engaged further in this externalization policy. So a concrete example is a safe third country um, concept, uh, which they also implement now, in addition to Syrians, to five other nationalities, including people from Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, and so on. Actually, the top five nationalities applying for international protection in Greece, for them, it has been decided last year that actually Turkey is a safe third country. However, if we look at the reality on the ground in Turkey, then we can see that there is no protection available for these people. There is no access possibilities of them for services and so on. So I think this is also something that we should keep in mind that already before people are recognized, um, they are facing a lot of challenges. And what um, was said previously by um, Panos a, bit, a little bit about the EU um, on the one hand supporting Greece with the policy frameworks over the latest years, we would even go maybe one step further and say that the hotspots have been a bit of a test case of what we see today implemented in the EU Pact on Asylum and Migration. And we were very pleased to, to read in the, this study that um, has been produced by the Tarek report uh, and the policy book, so many useful recommendations that I think many civil society organizations, but also the UN and others have already been repeating for many years, because we unfortunately do not see in the EU Pact on Asylum and Migration that a lot of the evidence that is collected on the ground has been translated within the new Pact on EU, on, within the EU's new Pact on Asylum and Migration. If we, for instance, look at the hotspots, I think you have all seen the horrific pictures of the conditions that there are. While we now see that the EU wants to have what they call the pre-entry screening, that people would be screened at the borders. There is a fiction that this can happen in five days. Well, if we look at the reality in Greece is that people are stuck for months, some even years, at the hotspots. So the idea that this can happen in five days seems a little bit of an illusion at this stage and the five day um, yeah, the five day, um, the fact that people during those five days remain in a pre entry screening location where EU law apparently to some extent does not apply is also a fiction of how EU law should apply. Because from the moment that someone is entering the EU, of course, the EU's laws and legal frameworks should apply. When we look at um, integration and sustainable futures for EU displacement affected populations, it has already been said by UNHCR, it's of course important to recognize that the European Union has limited competence with regards to integration, because this remains mostly at the level of member states. And I think the EU is taking the lead with proposing action plans and so on. So I think in that regard, the main focus should be on member states and how they implement. And I think the EU is providing to a certain extent, of course, funding possibilities. But there, I think, as the Helios program is certainly one we can have a lot of lessons learned from, we should make sure that those uh, programs are also effective and that they're not actually also a way of deterring people to leave the country and preventing them almost from accessing opportunities. Um, so then maybe one or two more caveats when we look at um, the people before they are able to um, be part of, say, I said, a common European asylum system, we see still today that a lot of people are prevented from accessing their rights. We see pushbacks happening at the EU's external borders that remain um, present to most of the EU's borders. Um, Ukraine is definitely an exception. Um, for instance, the RC has a program in Bosnia and Herzegovina where we do protection monitoring as part of a humanitarian program and where only um, in the last couple of years, we have re recorded on EDRC and others or civil society or partners are doing similar things. Thousands of pushbacks. Um, to give you an idea, in, um, to, in March 2022, 25% of the people that rec recorded a pushback said that they did not have access to international protection. 36% of the people reported physical abuse. 38% of the people reported theft of destruction of property. So if we don't provide people the opportunity to access their right to asylum, they will never be able to access all the rights that are actually, that a person is entitled to within the EU from the moment that he or she is an applicant for international protection. And we think that definitely there, the access to international protection is key. And we have heard it in the previous panel too. In the EU, there is a massive... Um, distinction between the, the, Euro, the URE 
um, protection available and the de facto protection available. Actually, if we look at the EU's legal framework as it exists, uh, we believe that it's quite good. The problem is the enforcement of the framework. And I think this is definitely where we believe that, of course, there is also a role for the Commission um, because, and that I think is contrary to integration, uh, there is the EU asylum acquis, and we believe that there the EU Commission's role should be to ensure that member states respect their obligations under the acquis. Um, and I think that, in combination, as was also, of course, said by our colleague of UNHCR and others today, it's really important to also listen to people that are affected by these policies when we discuss them and to also see what we can learn from that. Thanks a lot. Uh, this were very, very uh, many details you touched upon, and I think very um, comprehensively also um, put the, the, the finger at the, at the wounds, I would say, uh, of, of our um, EU asylum system at the end of the day uh, in many ways. But uh, I, I also would echo very much what you said. Um, the legal framework is the one side. Uh, it depends very much um, um, how it is implemented. Uh, well, uh, this brings me <laughs> uh, to... to <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, coming to you, uh, Cecilia Berklich, I hope, I hope uh, it is a bit uh, okay pronounced, uh, uh, you're the uh, deputy head of uh, the asylum unit at uh, Dietrich Home, um, 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 and uh, I think you, I saw you noted quite uh, many things, uh, starting from um, what we heard at, uh, at the video clip uh, about the lives uh, that people themselves told about uh, the destitution they, 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 they find themselves. Um, and uh, now also uh, what we heard before from, from, from uh, Panos, uh, Benjamin and, 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 and Ferruccio and, and, and now from Birte and, and of course from UNHCR. One thing that we have in traffic is we, we say a bit this paradigm shift which we should bring people at the heart of solutions, that we should uh, look into this. And I think uh, this was also a bit what, uh, what uh, Birte suggested uh, just a few seconds ago. Um, and I would ask you actually, what can mobility play a part here? Also intra-EU mobility, um, I, would, I would say so. And the second thing I would also like to ask you, because it was also in the panel, uh, if you remember before, what we speak here, we speak here about education, work, migration. And we know it from national um, administrations. These are in different ministries, more mainly. But also within the commission, it's uh, DJ Home. It's uh, many other DJs are involved here. How, because one of our, our, our takeaways is also, how can we overcome this, um, uh, this policy silos that not everybody thinks uh, just along migration, just along education, just along uh, employment. So yeah, please. Um, a lot of topics uh, for you to cover, I think. Yeah, a lot of topics, but uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I want to pass the greetings of Esther, my head of unit, who was supposed to be here. But because of uh, uh, the uh, challenges we have to meet in terms of the Ukraine crisis, it wasn't possible for her to, to join. But uh, she sends her greetings. And um, listening to what... Um, what I've heard from the, from the speakers, but also the documentary and the one I saw this morning still in my office, the one in, in, in um, Kenya. Um, there is, and I think that is an important uh, uh, message to pass. There is indeed a, quite a difference between what the law says and what the reality on the ground tells us. Um, looking at uh, Ukraine, in fact, what you are, are asking me comes, comes basically together. And I would like to use it as an example. Um, one of the things which has kept us very busy is coordination. Uh, and in particular, uh, our unit, because we, uh, we prepared the decision to trigger the temporary protection directive. So everything on temporary protection came to us in the weeks that was following, including on working permits, on residence permits, on schooling, whatever. Um, it took a bit of time for the commission to organize itself because you know, you're not, we're not used to do this kind of, 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 of uh, coordination, not at this level, um, because the, the directive was never actually triggered. So uh, there was no, let's say, no, no real plan to, uh, to address it, but we, man we managed in the end. But I think one has to be realistic also. And that I think explains a bit also the, uh, a bit the gap between what the law says and what is the reality on the ground. Um, 
coordination means endless meetings. And it also means that you find out a lot of things which are not okay, and which you try to address bilaterally with member states, where some do respond and others do not respond. But this is kind of continuous monitoring what happens on the ground. And we have 26 because Denmark is not involved, but then Denmark has a law, so we want to understand what they are doing. The Schengen Associated countries have laws, we want to understand what they're doing. And even the Western Balkans have now uh, their own instruments and we want to understand what they are doing. Then we have to look at the funding, which is extremely complex. Then we have to see what third countries like to do because the Americans and the Canadians are also involved to some extent because this goes beyond, beyond Europe after all. And to coordinate all these actors, uh, we finally decided to, um, to go for something which we haven't used before, is a kind of solidarity platform to actually discuss the operational measures. Just to give an example, um, people are coming to, yes, to our front line, to the new front line member states, uh, the one in the East now, but also to Moldova because that's another country that borders Ukraine. But Moldova is a rather poor country compared to, to our member states. They have too many, so we have to transfer them to Europe. But then to which member states? Who's going to transfer them? It has to be done on a voluntary basis. How are you going to organize that? Um, without transferring yourself or transforming yourself into a kind of travel agency. No? Um, but that is that requires uh, 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 so much coordination that we have you have to do it. But um, in daily life, I don't think this would work policy wise, because it absorbs all your capacity completely. Um, I think we have on, put on hold most of our other work. We are now resuming a bit uh, uh, the other policies, but very really step by step. And. Um, so again, uh, to be realistic about it, yes, you have to overcome the silos. But even if we would overcome our silos internally within the commission, which is a, a, a challenge, to do that within the 26, I often have the impression we are co coordinating the different ministries of the member states. Because we are having one network, we have another network, and then we have a third network, and you have the impression they're not talking to each other. Uh, so we also coordinate to some extent a bit the member states, but um, it is a bit uh, learning by doing, and uh, I think expectations should to be a, a, bit, a bit real, realistic here. On the mobility part, that's very interesting. Um, listening also to the first speaker, my impression is it's not only about mobility, and we should not uh, uh, think that that would solve much of the challenges, problems, uh, which uh, uh, the people concerned encounter. Uh, uh, listening to what Birgit said earlier, for example, putting uh, the places where you have to go to for education in a location which can't be easily reached. I mean, why as a member state are you doing that? I mean, th 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 why can't you organize that a bit better? Um, these are things which are not in the law. Uh, and you're not going to put in, put in the law, make sure that the center is easily accessible, because what means easily accessible? By train, by bus, by God knows what. So it, it's this kind of implementation which makes it very difficult. And that has nothing to do with mobility in the sense, I think, which, which you want to uh, address in your, in your uh, research. It is about, as, a, as, as, an, as, as an official, as a government, think about what your citizens and in the broader sense of the word, those who are on your uh, territory need. I just want to give a, an example completely outside this, um, this area, but to, to make you understand what I tried to explain. I need to get a new passport. In the old days, a couple of years ago, I could go to the um, embassy of my member state in Brussels, just around the corner, a Schumann place, very convenient. Now I looked on the website, I have to go to Luxembourg. I mean, I have to take one day off. Luxembourg, for God's sake, why? I mean, most of us work in Brussels, not in Luxembourg. And then they give you an alternative. I got to go to a city in my home, uh, in my home country, a couple of cities I can choose. I looked at the seven and eight where I can go, and I identified one where I thought they had a user-friendly approach. 
which would mean that I wouldn't have to take two days off where I knew what to do and they would give me the green light before I would go there and I would know that I wouldn't have to go that three or five or six times. I only had to go twice. So as a government, as, as, a, as a, a public uh, a body, you can implement policies in a consumer citizen friendly way. And I said that, 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 that has nothing to do whether you have rights or not, you do have the rights, but the way they're implemented and certainly the way they're being approached by, by national authorities can make just that, that real difference. And what, what, what struck me was the perseverance, but also the way in which uh, all these people who were interviewed, they were not giving up. And sometimes that gave me a bit the feeling of uh, uh, the situation where you feel you have to fight against your government because they, the way they react is so bureaucratic that it gives the impression like, don't I look upon me as a human being? And that is something which struck me also in, 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 in what we saw uh, uh, just, just now. And one, uh, one element, um, I think it was one of the three regions where it was said that the state is absent or almost absent. That is a very bad sign. It's a very bad sign that the state is almost absent because uh, uh, I think we all as, as, as persons need the state to some extent to be recognized as a person. And I think it boils down in the end to being recognized, having an official status, which allows you then to exercise your rights, including some form of free movement. I've, I've noted uh, uh, some suggestions to make it more than three months. Um, those are things I think where, where reflection could be, could be useful. But it boils down to this, to this uh, general perception of uh, whether as, as a state, as a community, you want to invest in these people in the end, because they also invest in these societies. I found that very striking when one of the gentlemen said, um, uh, we, 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 not, we don't exist for the state, but yet we work there and we provide services and we are present on the ground. Um, that must be a rather uh, uncomfortable, to, uncomfortable position to in because you don't have a right to vote either. So you can't influence the, the, the debate either. And we all know this very nice uh, British saying, uh, 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 no taxes without representation. But this, you could even say not working without representation. So to, to reflect that also at, uh, at the level of giving people literally a voice, and that's probably, and I want to conclude with that, that's probably also the great advantage of these videos. You actually gave people a voice, and I found it, uh, I found it extremely interesting. Many thanks. Thank you. Uh, you gave your best to address as many uh, of the uh, things that were, were, were put forward. Uh, we are quite advanced in time, um, uh, but I would like to have one round of questions. Um, so I would like to again start with uh, audience uh, here, uh, and uh, and then we would uh, turn to to online audience. So please, uh, let's collect one, two questions uh, from the board. Yeah, uh, please. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Anila. I am representing uh, a refugee net network here. My question is for all of you who are sitting and uh, to Yunus here. Oh, everything which I'm hearing is really important, amazing. And being a representative of a limited community who has not that much here today, how we make sure these recommendations who are coming up different part of these traffic reports, we can advocate for that recommendation together and how we can put the understanding because during lunch we were thinking these reports or uh, you know, uh, commission or UNICEF's, uh, even global compact of refugee have so much complicated terms, which is difficult for us to understand and advocate for that. So how we can make a easy um, you know, translation to understanding for the communities by saying that I would like to invite all of you. We are working on a European level as well. I myself am part of expert group with the commission and we are helping them to connect because somehow we are missing, uh, sitting in the same room, we are having different approach and different of understanding. So this is kind of request and not only question, we are here and we really want to make sure in 2020, uh, to ending by this promise, we are not repeating what we were doing before COVID. Thank you so much. Very, very good uh, uh, suggestion and, and question. Um, anyone else still from, from the audience here? Have one more. 
Thank you. Um, to all the panelists, I would just have a short question. On the externalization file, um, what are your organizations doing to stop this process, which is more, we all know, more harming than anything else for the refugees? And probably we can, uh, okay, good. Uh, then we will uh, take these two questions and it gives me actually then also the chance to give each of you one more time the floor to probably um, uh, actually on both, uh, on both questions, uh, what you have to say. Um, and um, probably I would also add one more small question, which I actually thought it would come naturally in a way, uh, because um, in this whole situation that we have with Ukraine and temporary protection, I think there's for me at least two things that shine out um, that both that what we investigated quite long in traffic in the last three years, mobility and networks are so fundamental for, for this particular solution. But why is it possible that it's so fundamental? Because Ukrainians are allowed to travel visa free and uh, they can like this follow the opportunities that they have. They can follow the networks that they have. And this is also what we saw. People go to Poland, people go to Spain because they have language skills or they know somebody. I think this is a bit, brings me a bit back to the vision that uh, Elvan said today in the very morning when we set off, when people can really purposeful go to the place where they think they can be the best uh, addition, the best support and find themselves also in order to create livelihood. And I would like, probably I can start with Panos, uh, with, with uh, Ferruccio, and then we go just uh, around here. Some reflections from, from your side. Please, please try to have um, two sentences, three sentences. Uh, and um... Yes, I think, of course, the, the Ukrainian, the war in Ukraine and, and the refugee crisis is uh, changing the agenda dramatically. And I fully understand that administrative res resources, energies are absorbed. And this is obvious and, and, and necessary, of course. But we, I think we, we have to do uh, what we can in our respective roles to avoid that this uh, res massive you know, reshuffle in the agenda becomes permanent, you know, becomes routine. Uh, and, and here, <clears throat> because that wouldn't, Fair, that wouldn't be, uh, you know, conduce to any anything good. And, and here I come to, to the key issue uh, raised by Yanila, that is how to build coalitions uh, in order to to avoid that that you know everything is you know, drained and obscured and changed structurally by by the massive tragedy we are experiencing in Europe. Uh, you know, we, we risk that Europe closes itself. Uh, and, and focuses all attention, Europe and, 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 and other organizations. I think of NATO that is becoming completely oriented to, to a certain priority, which is understandable, but what about the Mediterranean? What about Africa? So keeping this, this global strategic balance at all levels, you know, from, from capitals and summits to, to, op to op operational levels to, to implementation that is indeed crucial. This is the massive challenge I think we have ahead and, and building coalitions between, you know, researchers for the little we can do and bring, but, you know, uh, NGOs, international NGOs, international organizations, institutions at all levels, media is, I think, we, we are in another project focusing on migration narratives and we are, you know, documenting the huge, you know, shift in migration narratives on, between how the Ukrainian uh, migration, forced migration flow is, is narrated with a very keen attention to individual stories, to, you know, individual destinies and lives, which is the way it should be done. And the horrible massification, uh, nullification of individuals, you know, the, the you know, the way, uh, migration across Libya, across the Mediterranean, is narrated as a sort of, you know, collective glut uh, with no individual you know, there. And this is striking. And this is what we, I think, should try and find ways to coalize, coalesce against. 
I'm very, very much in accordance with, uh, with what uh, Perusov has said. Uh, perhaps as a quick uh, reaction from my point of view, the, uh, well, maybe a comment on that is that it depends on uh, the more specific or the more local, uh, the, the, these quali coalitions may work uh, differently, different layers and scales. Um, but I leave it as, as general as it is uh, with respect to, to Anila. Sometimes I've been involved in a project concerning housing, and that wouldn't work uh, in, in uh, civil society, university, local authority, that sort of coalition, perhaps would not be able to work um, the same constructive way, even on a national scale. So uh, I, I would just put the scale, uh, let's say, perspective and, and the the topic, the area of work, but this is a, a thing. Um, yeah, the way Martin put, uh, uh, there's a different way of uh, thinking about uh, forced migration uh, with respect to the Ukrainian crisis. And uh, maybe thinking of this uh, as um, resupling, yes, uh, we cannot live on by, uh, on going constant uh, to shift some policy, but maybe uh, such a reaction would be a way to uh, focusing on uh, leaving people go where the networks are or the opportunities are and the free person, somehow regulated, uh, may, may show a, a, a way. I'm just, uh, they're very fresh, the reactions, and they also appeared in uh, Mudassar's uh, um, um, talk about, uh, um, the um, change, regime change in Afghanistan and reactions, at least from European governments. We don't want another, our minister, I think, said something like, we don't want, want another 2015 uh, being repeated. But uh, there's a completely different narrative uh, these days uh, with respect uh, and vis-a-vis -vis the Ukrainian crisis. And maybe that's, uh, there's, a, there's something good to come out of it. If yeah, um, I'll keep it short. Um, I think we, we saw clearly mobility cannot be ignored, right? People's mobility and past migration experiences that they cannot be ignored, they're part of their lives and you cannot fight it, right? And you can, and all the efforts to impede people's mobility are harming, uh, are very, very harmful. And I think states are fooling themselves as they believe that, uh, that they are able to regain control that has been framed by some politicians also in Germany or so by further illegalizing and criminalizing people's mobility, also mobility of recognized refugees within Europe. Um, I also made clear, I think very clear that issues like family unification or so, it's urgent to really break barriers there so that it's much easier for people, the family unification procedures become simplified um, so that people can rely on them that the question of what a family is and who falls under family that need to be broadened up. Um, what is, and then it's what, what you mentioned in terms of like stress of coordinating all the different silos in this. I think this is partially due because each policy field or so, you know, they retain somehow their identity by becoming more and more and more specific and each field having more and more different complicated legal procedures and different legal categories. And then we also see that the system became so overcomplicated and, and complex also in terms of with very many different legal statuses with many different um, yeah, visa, uh, visa opportunities that are granted or not the different titles that people can get also in Germany or so it became to extent where you cannot where it creates more problems than what these different regulations actually control. So simplification of um, procedures, simplification of all these um, legal titles. And this, I think that would contribute um, also like e making life easier for people and also making it easier for, for those who have to coordinate these activities. This is Lavak. If you have uh, two sentences, I would like to yes. bring this more time in, but please two sentences, I have no ways of showing. Yes, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, yes, very quickly um, on the situation in Ukraine. Yes, I, I can also confirm 
or rather um, add to what was already said. Um, we are uh, in UNHCR, we welcome very much the, uh, the outpouring of solidarity that uh, we have observed since the start of the war and the decision to activate the temporary protection directive is particularly welcome. This is an example of um, what we think is the best approach when uh, when a crisis, uh, a refugee crisis unfolds, to swiftly give a protected status to people without the need to undergo an individual refugee status determination process, which could take a lot more time. Um, and in terms of crisis, this is the best uh, way forward. Um, it will all come down to the way that it's implemented in the different member states. This is a, an additional challenge that would come forward. Um, and one which also um, we need to find a way to balance uh, with the rest of um, the refugee populations in those countries. I mean, we are very happy to see, um, as I said, the, um, this overwhelming support, but we also are um, cautious about creating, uh, about governments creating sort of a two a group approach uh, when it comes to protection of refugees. On the one hand, we have the Ukrainian refugees we, who are welcome to have immediate access to services. And then on the other hand, we have refugees from other countries who don't necessarily have um, access to services in the same way, be it um, that uh, provision of housing is, uh, for example, favored, uh, for refugees for Ukraine or uh, possibilities to commute within cities or uh, access to any type of other social services. So uh, we really need to keep this in mind, not to allow for a discriminatory regime to appear um, while at the same time uh, continue um, efforts uh, on uh, welcoming refugees from Ukraine. Um, well, I wanted just to, to reflect on a question that was raised on the externalization. This is a, a, one of our biggest concerns and with what we saw recently that uh, with the agreement that the UK um, signed with Rwanda, for example, this is one of our worst case scenarios, let's say for Europe. Um, this is a point which we are raising on all levels. The High Commissioner, whenever he visits or has a call with the um, EU institutions, he always raises this point that uh, this is not a way to go forward. Um, and we will be adamant about this um, until the end. We don't, we don't think that this is uh, that outsourcing responsibilities in any way um, helping anyone, not, not refugees, not biggest hosting countries who host 80% of all refugees globally, um, and not uh, member states themselves, because this is only, um, only a matter of time that more problems are created this way. Um, and then just uh, on the other question, which was um, about how do we engage more um, in UNHCR, we try really um, hard to engage with NGOs and particularly refugee-led organizations. We have uh, the uh, regional consultations, for example, that take place every year. We have global consultations as well with NGOs and refugee-led organizations. Um, in our Brussels office, we um, have uh, organized quite a few events, um, such as trainings for refugee advocates on what are the most important lines, what things we uh, refugees, uh, refugee advocates need to, to keep in mind or be aware of when advocating. Um, we do think that uh, refugee participation uh, and their and refugees place on the table is absolutely crucial um, and we try to support it in any in every way that we can um, I'll, I'll stop it here thank you very much thank you directly to you Peter. again and thanks George, mindful please. of time as well um, with regards to the first question i think indeed it's also important that we being based here in brussels are a little bit of self-reflective and each time that there is the opportunity to invite someone um, that represents uh, the community to also ensure that a state of the table is given. So I think this is also something where we, uh, being based here, should uh, focus on. 
With regards to the externalization file, um, of course, Denmark, as most of you are most likely aware, is also in negotiations with Rwanda. Um, we don't really know where this is going, um, but I mean, we have definitely appreciated UNHCRs and others, as we have done, of course, also in Denmark and at different levels, speaking out against this. I think there are two um, important um, things to follow. On the one hand, there is, of course, looking at the legality of these proposals. And on the other hand, there is also providing the evidence um, advocacy, evidence-based advocacy that um, the places where these people want to be returned to, it will be very difficult to uphold their rights and the overall standards that people are facing in case they would be returned. So I think there are definitely um, a lot of room for advocacy that we're trying to do, but it's also sometimes about not giving too much platform to something that we, of course, still hope will never happen uh, because we don't believe it's the right way forward. Um, and then indeed, if we look at Ukraine, um, I think we could only be hopeful that this new standards that has, we have seen with regards to Ukrainians arriving um, is the new way that the EU will approach uh, people coming in the future. But of course, there are a couple of signs that this may not be the case because uh, the, the proposal from the Commission did include everyone fleeing Ukraine after the 24th of February, but then the member states have limited the scope already. And I think this is a clear example of where we will continue seeing member states actually having a really securitized approach, actually um, trying to limit their responsibilities. Um, so I think, as was also said by UNHCR, it will be key for us to continue monitoring whether there is effective access to the rights that are granted both under the TPD, Temporary Protection Directive, um, the special legal framework in Denmark and other countries, uh, but also to ensure that other refugees still have access to their rights. And I think this is indeed to ensure that there are not two different standards. Um, this is where we will have to continue advocating, but at least I think we should also try to use this welcoming momentum um, and let's hope it's not temporary, because I think, well, of course, it's not comparable to what we saw when there was the war in, um, in Syria. We should also recognize that in 2015, many people were also European citizens, also were very welcoming. We had stations in Berlin that were full with people accepting people to come. There is just a very big risk that this is very temporary, while we can actually learn as some of the things that also did today has again restated. A lot of people are only longer in forced displacement. Protected displacement is taking a longer term. So let's hope that this solidarity is not very temporary in nature and that we can actually use this momentum to engage more people and create a positive narrative around people arriving because that is applicable, I think, to those coming from Ukraine but many other countries too. Okay, I try to be short. <laughs> On externalization, our commissioner said it is inhumane. So we do not know how you can process people somewhere in Africa in a humane way when they have come to your shore first. So as she said, it's not humane to do this. That, that was her reply. Uh, how to stop it? Well, we'll have to see. Uh, also in the case of Denmark, they have to comply with certain rules. So we have a bit of a say there. We don't have a complete free hand. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult, uh, difficult discussion. And it shows also how divergent the views and the positions are on this, uh, on this, on this matter. And, and they don't seem to converge, I have the impression. Quickly on Ukraine, I, I agree with you, uh, Martin, uh, networks, as we call them, the diaspora, and also um, the fact that they had visa-free travel is, is important. Yet what we also observe that quite uh, large groups stay in the countries of first entry because they want to go back as soon as they can um, in terms of mobility. So there, there the mobility is more reduced. And we also observe that many who come are women with children. And of course, the moment the children are in schools, I don't think the family will move forward. I think they are happy that they found a school, that they found a place to, uh, to live, and then probably the mobility will, uh, will stop there. But uh, we'll have to learn our lessons from this, and it will probably be very interesting to draw the lessons from this, not only for this particular instrument, but I think for the whole uh, wider discussion on, on asylum and migration. In that sense, if we can turn this into something positive, uh, it was a good side to every bad thing. Um, that would already be, already be an advantage, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you to all. Um, this was the final panel now. It does not mean that uh, our traffic uh, ends. Uh, we will for sure uh, also come to the commission uh, one more time because I think it's not 
there's a lot of written in there where we also I think have uh, collected all this evidence that uh, that we see right now with uh, with the Ukrainian case and I think we will continue promoting um, uh, these things mobility networks but all what we heard in the last uh, this day today uh, I'm deeply sorry that we took more time than uh, than we thought initially um, I don't know uh, I think uh, I will hand back to Elvan but before I would like to have a short applause for our panel here thank you very much for being here. Okay, <laughs> this is a daunting task, isn't it, to, to close uh, such a rich, especially a rich panel we just had. Um, so I want to go back to what we started with in the morning. Um, and I wrote something down here. I mean, we, we are advocating for a paradigm shift, right? We, a people-based approach. And we, uh, we looked at this in terms of understanding people as, and their interconnections and their networks and the capacities and potential they have and enabling that, supporting that. And this is our vision. And just by listening, I started to wonder, I mean, who is the system serving? And it's certainly not the people who are in this position. And I think Anila also made reference to it in our first panel. We may soon all find ourselves in a position where we are forcibly displaced. And that's when all of these questions that we are dealing with here from the perspective of a government or an institution, or even as a researcher, we've never had to deal with, and then we'll see. And I don't want it to have to come to that point. And this labyrinth that we have here so strongly as a metaphor, um, this is self-created. And what we want to do is remove it, break it down. There's no need for such bureaucratic solutions, quote unquote, that are supposed to be temporary, but that become lived and, and forever. So I, let's, let's imagine breaking down walls, little by little, maybe just a few more doors first um, and pathways. So I'll end that here. And I want to start with a series of thank yous. Okay. Thank you first to our consortium partners for everybody for being here and being on our panels, our guests, who were kind enough to give their time today. Um, I want to start by thanking the commission and the commission who funded our project um, through an incredibly difficult time, <laughs> the pandemic. And we were lucky enough to have a project officer for the duration of our project, which is not to be taken for granted. So Christina, we thank you very much for all of your support and understanding. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for us too, thank you. Um, symbolically in absentia, I want to thank all of our research participants, um, those of us, those who gave their time to our researchers and shared very personal stories and personal moments with us. We want to thank them. We want to thank those of our members, uh, our partners in the field who weren't able to join us today, especially part of the second panel. Um, and I want to thank the ICMPD for organizing this event and doing such a great job of it, particularly those behind the scenes, making it always look so easy, which it's not. And that would be Caitlin and Melina and Gizem and Marit. So thank you very much for this wonderful day. Before you all leave, we have some extra refreshments here. Um, please take as many publications um, and stay for a chat perhaps. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>